welcome to the very first Online Designers and Geeks with very special guest, Aaron Walter. Um, thanks, Aaron, for coming out tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so a little bit, um, just the history of the event, uh, Designers and Geeks about 10 years old. Um, I think we've run somewhere between 250 and 300 events over the years. Uh, in, in cities around the U.S. And uh, this today is actually the very first online event that we have ever done. So um, I'm excited for that. Um, I, I actually never thought about Designers and Geeks as an online event. <laughs> um, we always, I, I think the initial kind of kernel was to actually get people together in person and um, you know, and bring real life experiences to the, the sort of online world. So um, here we are um, in a different world now, I think with the pandemic happening. Uh, but um, this is such a cool platform. And I'm sure many folks were in the networking just now. Um, that is a lot of fun. So just public service announcement. Um, you know, after Aaron's talk, there'll be plenty of time to jump back into that and, um, and network with more of the attendees in the, in the space. So, um, a little bit more about the, um, format and session. Uh, so we're going to get started with Aaron's talk here in a moment. Uh, after that, um, you can probably see in the left nav, there's a sessions tab. Uh, that is for more of a group discussion with multiple participants. Um, Aaron, myself, and hopefully many of uh, you attendees will will jump into that and we'll have um, just open discussion on the topic, Q&A with Aaron, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, and then, of course, um, I left the networking function open throughout the event, so if you want to pop in there at any point, you're welcome to do so. Um, it looks like the hop in platform kind of functions like a live conference where you can kind of dip in and out of the sessions if you want to. So, um, so let's see, uh, Aaron, I think your last talk with designers and geeks, well, the first talk I think was in 2013. That sounds uh, right. yep. Yep. Yeah. You were with MailChimp. I was. Uh, had you written the first version of your book at that point? I had, yeah. I okay. wrote it uh, back in 2011. Okay, nice. Um, and so feels a little bit worlds away now, but uh, I remember it being a great talk and um, so great to have you back now. Um, you are, um, of course, known for your work uh, at MailChimp in the early days, uh, in addition to your books, and now you're with Envision. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So I lead the, the content team. Um, used to be the design education team, but um, we spent a lot of time uh, just kind of investigating how design teams work, um, helping them learn best practices, uh, and a lot of publishing around that. Fantastic. Um, Envision has been such a powerful platform for collaboration and design, and, and one that I'm sure almost everybody in the audience here has used. So um, nice work there. Thank you. <laughs> I can't uh, take credit. <laughs> I know you can't take credit for all of it, but <laughs> for your yeah. part in it. Um, well, great. Um, I, uh, I think uh, we'll get started on your talk if you're ready. Um, Sounds great. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you want to share your screen, I will figure out how to leave the main stage. <laughs> all right. Can everybody see? Everybody see can. my screen? Yep. Uh, maybe just a quick thumbs up or something in the chat would be good. All right. And well, I think, and, and just for context, um, we are talking about 30 seconds or so ahead of when they're hearing it. So, um, okay. Yeah, there, That's there we go. They can see. So, okay. Excellent. All right. All right. Um, well, good luck. I'll see you later. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us uh, today. Um, excited to be back. Designers and Geeks is such an amazing um, organization, uh, such an amazing community. Um, I was just joking with Joe. You know, he was saying that he'd run almost 300 events, um, and there should be some lifetime achievement. So I think we all owe Joe a debt of gratitude for um, the continued investment he's made 
in, um, in our community. So happy to, to be back. Um, I want to take you back to a time that uh, was a lot simpler than 2020, and that is 2011. That was when I published uh, the first edition of Designing for Emotion. And I have to admit, the way that I felt uh, in writing that first edition of the book um, was the spirit of the revolution that Sir Tim Berners-Lee sparked in the early 90s when he created the World Wide Web and HTML. Um, and from that, you know, getting involved in the web and publishing and learning how to code and design and create this, this brand new platform for communication was super exciting and inspiring to me. And, uh, I had high ideals of what was possible back in 2011, as I was writing that first edition and working at MailChimp, growing that company. Um, but if you are a student of history, like I am, you know that revolutions, they start with high ideals and there's a point of reckoning where those ideals, uh, the rubber meets the road and we start to grasp whether or not those ideals can be put into practice in various circumstances and what the breakpoints are for those ideals. We have a lot of good intentions, whether you're a designer, a developer, product manager, we're making software and putting it into the world. The reason why this is exciting to us, we're, we're makers, we make things. And we have such great intentions that we bring to our work. Sometimes the outcomes of what we create are not expected. Just having good intentions does not mean that what we make actually has positive outcomes on the world as we expected. And that's something that we've learned. Our revolution that Sir, Tur Sir Tim Berners-Lee has sparked and so many others has evolved in this evolution. And now we have this moment of reckoning. Um, We've seen just this year, we've seen a lot this year, but one of the things we saw is um, Facebook facing a boycott um, from advertisers because of uh, general perceptions about um, how they've not yet addressed hate speech um, effectively. Um, we've seen um, software platforms being misused to steal identities, um, to influence elections, um, there are a lot of things that are happening that we did not intend to happen when we were creating these things. So here we are in one of the weirdest years in human history where twin hurricanes hit the Gulf while California is on fire during a pandemic and a very contentious election. This is a year uh, that none of us will soon forget. And amidst all of this, uh, glo global events and uh, our platforms that are being misused and, and abused in ways that we really didn't anticipate. Um, we, we have to, we have to reflect on what we're making and how we're making it. Those ideals, um, we need to broaden our perspective of what we're making and how we're doing it. Even Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, said, this is a, an interview that he did with Vanity Fair a while back. He said, we demonstrated that the web had failed instead of serving humanity as it was supposed to have done and failed in so many places. The increasing centralization of the web ended up producing with no deliberate action of the people who designed the platform, a large scale emergent phenomenon, which is anti-human. It's a really tough thing to reckon with, you know, that we've invested our lives, our, our life's energy in things that end up being unintentionally anti-human and, and not serving the greater good that we thought we were. And so as I think about that 2011, that first edition of Designing for Emotion, where I was challenging the design community, the software community more broadly to think beyond just creating functional and reliable and usable software, uh, that we could make something that is delightful, that feels good to use. Much like a chef tries to transcend creating edible food, uh, we designers and, and developers and product people, uh, we shouldn't just be making usable products. We should ma be making products that people love to use. But that's a very narrow spectrum of the human experience, that delight or feeling joy. It's a bit like eating dessert for every meal would taste great initially, but after a while, it's so much sugar, um, it's not satisfying. 
I just released the second edition of Designing for Emotion, which was a big rethink of this idea of designing for delight. And that feels like such a small myopic phrase, designed for delight. Uh, when there's, there's so much more happening in our world today, that's just amplifying and, um, you know, emotion and it's, it's, uh, amplifying inequity. It's really changing our perspective on what we're doing and who we are as people. So let's continue to design functional and reliable and usable software, but let's think about all emotions. Let's think about the positive emotion and the really negative emotions and all that's in between. And we can design for all of those things and consider those, the, what people are bringing to the things that we make. So design for the spectrum of all emotions, not just delight. That phrase designed for delight is too small for us today. So I wanna to talk to you about that today and I wanna show you how some companies are thinking about the complex emotions that people bring to their products to inspire you, to help you expand your perspective on what you're making and how you're making, and maybe challenge your teams to think um, with a broader worldview. And I wanna start with you here at trust and fear, because these things are top of mind for so many of us today, feeling a sense of fear of uncertainty during um, a year of a pandemic that we don't know how long it's gonna last, um, you know, when will we have a vaccine? When will I find a new job? When will, um, you know, any number of things happen? When will the fires be put out? Um, there's a lot happening in our world. Joe and I were just talking about this before we came on air because Joe is in the uh, uh, financial technology space. Banking is one of the most fraught industries when it comes to trust and fear. And designing for trust, to inspire trust, and designing to address the fears that people have uh, is a real challenge with banking because there's this legacy of being taken advantage of. Uh, we all remember Wells Fargo and opening accounts for people who did not ask for those accounts. Um, I'm sure you have a personal story. I certainly have lots of personal stories of banks doing things that were pretty shady that ended up with a lot of fees. Um, you know, coming out of my wallet that uh, were not intended and didn't feel like a fair shake. So banking has this, this legacy to overcome. And in research for the, the new edition of my book, Designing for Emotion, uh, I talked with Rudy Adler. He's the co-founder and uh, chief design officer at Wealthsimple, which is an automated investment platform. And he said to me, banks are so distrusted because they have a very confusing way of talking about things and presenting fees. It's almost like their business model is purposefully confusing. That might ring true for you. We know what we do is different. It's hard to explain automated investing to someone who's never heard the phrase automated investing, let alone to someone who's never invested a penny. We wanted to make a site that provided information as simply, clearly, and beautifully as possible as possible. And we wanted a central metaphor that was fun, elegant, and the opposite of tech confusing. So well simple, if you've seen their site, um, this is what it looks like. The metaphor that Rudy was alluding to is a Rube Goldberg machine. Those are those highly complicated machines where a boot hits uh, a tennis ball that rolls down a ramp and uh, bumps into a goose that lays an egg and opens a gate. Um, remember that scene in Goonies? Um, that sort of complexity. It, it's, it's like a tongue-in-cheek sense of humor, of sophistication that they're using here. It's a bit of irony in what they're doing. The production value of their website is so high. In fact, it's so high that I naively asked Rudy when I interviewed him, I said, how did you guys build these Rube Goldberg machines? He said... <laughs> It's actually, we just hired a really good uh, design team to, to do the 3D animation. It just looks so real. And there's something that's happening here um, called the primacy effect, that your first impression, we have first impressions of each other when we meet. We also have first impressions of products. First impression of this, this automated investing platform is pretty sophisticated, right? If they put this much uh, detail into just their marketing homepage, What's happening behind the scenes? 
Now that might not be processing um, in your uh, kind of conscious mind, but it's certainly processing in our unconscious mind as we interact with this website. It's sophisticated. It feels um, like there's a, a very thoughtful approach taken to this. This feels different than every other bank I've interacted with. So using craft and careful consideration to inspire trust. By the way, they ended up winning a Webby for that uh, website, and you can see why. But it doesn't stop there with Wealth Simple. You log into your dashboard and you take a look at your, your dashboard and your, your holdings. Um, it's a perfect time to talk about this topic of fear in, in the financial industry because we're in the midst of a recession, though the stock market would tell us otherwise. And we saw a huge drop, a historic drop in the markets um, earlier this year. At that time, there's probably a lot of us that felt a great sense of fear watching your holdings plummet. It feels like um, your money just fell into the Grand Canyon. And that leads us to take, a take action, that when we have a lot of fear, our instincts as humans is do something about it. Things are on fire. Things are going bad. Let's do something about it. As a matter of fact, that's actually the worst thing you can do when it comes to your finances is that when the markets are falling apart, the best thing you can do is actually hold tight and wait for the storm to pass because it will pass. Historically, um, if we zoom out of the stock market and look at that data from a very wide lens, we see that it trends up and to the right which is exciting. And that's why so many people continue to invest in the markets, despite the volatility, despite the, the, the big um, dips that we see. So what felt like was the Grand Canyon can actually look like a pothole if we just take a different perspective. And in this case with Wealth Simple, instead of showing a time horizon that's the last 90 days, where it does look like it's the Grand Canyon of, of financial you know, deficit and destruction, zoom out to be, you know, five years. And it looks like, ah, okay, it's just a pothole. It's just a little blip. I can see where we're headed. So they also, um, you know, design emails and communication, right? Communication that addresses fear as, uh, you know, the markets change in unexpected ways. We've also seen companies like Apple use privacy as uh, a competitive competitive advantage. And they've spent a lot of time, even on their website, selling their products, their physical hardware, and their services, their software, and framing that in from the perspective of privacy. That if you buy into this system, all of those things, hardware, software, services, um, you can feel as that that your, you know, your data is encrypted. It's uh, not going to be sold for advertising. Um, you play, you know, you do pay a premium price, but with that premium price comes the assurance that um, this is a top priority and it's built into the company's value system. That is a competitive advantage. Let's talk about inclusion and empathy. This is a story that just doesn't end. Um, especially this year, it's, it's, it's top of mind for us uh, right now. Designing inclusively is such a core part of running any software team, any design team, any company, anything you're doing. If you're making software, hardware, uh, services, um, you know, you're selling physical goods, inclusion and empathy is good for business because it helps you reach more people. It's also the right thing to do. And this is something that um, it seems like in the software world, people are waking up to this um, you know, a little late to the game, if we're honest, you know, so many people are late to the game on this, um, but it's never too late. I've been chatting with Project Inkblot, uh, which is Boywin Gao and Jahan Manton. I co-host a podcast called Design Better with uh, my pal Eli Woolery. We had both of them on our podcast. Um, it's worth listening to. They're doing really interesting work. Um, Project Inkblot, the, the company that they run, thinks very carefully about designing for diversity. And they've built a framework that helps design teams, just all kinds of teams, reflect on what they're making 
going back to those good intentions that we bring to our work, but the gap that we have with the outcomes that, that come out of that. So their framework, um, it's called Designing for Diversity. If you Google Project Inkblot Design for Diversity, you're going to find this article uh, that goes into great detail. And there's a series of questions in there that you can bring to your team to spark discussion and put your shadows in front of you. These are the things, the perspectives that are missing from our team. Um, these are the things that we haven't considered. Let's put all of those shadows, the things that, that are behind us that we suppress or we, we don't, uh, don't see, let's put them in front of us so we can talk about those and identify biases that uh, influence our work and make our work less inclusive and less diverse. So the first question that they propose in their framework is, what's the worst case scenario of what you're making and on whom? The worst case scenario and on whom? So thinking about what you're making, um, uh, who's going to use it? And who are the uh, different communities that might have a negative impact? Your first response is probably like, no one's going to have negative impact. It's only going to be a good thing. Um, but in reality, there, uh, if we're not consciously thinking about inclusion, we are unconsciously um, enabling exclusion. So I talked about intention versus impact. That's a, a, um, a term, a phrase I, I'd love for you to take away. That's a, a really important concept to understand. And I want to talk to you about Airbnb. Um, and I, I think they're a great illustration of this. I actually just had a conversation with uh, Brian Chesky about this uh, on Tuesday. Uh, Brian Chesky is the CEO and, and co-founder of Airbnb. And I admire what he does because he steps forward and speaks honestly about the company's shortcomings. And he invests um, you know, pretty regularly in, in solving these problems. You may have heard of uh, the hashtag um, Airbnb while black, which became a phenomenon because um, there were so many African-Americans who were denied bookings um, because in the Airbnb process, names and faces are presented um, up front. No longer, uh, it's, it's names are up front, but faces are no longer shown. Their intention with that was really great of trying to create a trusting human relationship between a host and guest. But what was unintended is how it, that design decision or a series of design decisions played into racism and bias in so many hosts that, um, and, you know, that, that were already in the Airbnb community. There was a big study done on um, Airbnb bookings. Uh, Benjamin Edelman, Michael Luca, and Dan Sversky. Um, this is just a small excerpt. There's a link down below if you want to read that in more detail. Uh, it showed applications from guests with distinctly African-American names are 16% less likely to be accepted uh, relative to identical guests with distinctly white names. Um, and so that's a problem. It's, uh, it's been a big problem. And um, what Airbnb is doing, there's a, a new project called Project Lighthouse. Um, and I've seen behind the scenes, it's an algorithm for anonymizing data and then uh, aggregating data and looking at bookings and denials and dimensions that suggest that was denied on racism, you know, racist bias, um, or it was denied for some other reason. So they can start to spot those things. They've done some other things like requiring all of their hosts to take a pledge um, to be inclusive, which sounds kind of small. Like, is that really going to prevent anything? They actually had a million hosts uh, refuse to take that, that pledge, and they lost a lot of business from that. Um, I asked uh, Brian Chesky about that and, and how he thought about it just from like a revenue standpoint. And he said, you know, that he feels... Um, a responsibility not just to shareholders, but to the community, to serve the community, and to think about the short-term gain of a million bookings, um, or a, a million hosts, rather, um, and the hit that they take, that's really myopic that they're, you know, what, what you have to think is how do you build a great community? And in, you know, pushing out those one million hosts who would not take that pledge to not discriminate, um, we will never really know, but uh, the likelihood is that most of those, that's, that's probably decreasing um, 
a lot of the problems, support problems they would have had, um, potential violence or danger, uh, dangerous situations in the Airbnb community. So, you know, thinking about it from the long view, um, the phrase he said is it's, it's all about your time scale. And we take uh, a broader time scale than that narrow, just like, what does it do for us now? What does it earn for us right now? Um, I also had a great conversation today with um, the head of diversity and inclusion at Google, um, who was talking to me about uh, following up on the outcomes of your best intentions. So this is something that we need to get into the habit of and build into our processes. When we make things, we do research with our customers to try to dial in like, is this the right product market fit? Is this something that's valuable to, enough for people to pay for that will create a sustaining business? And once we ship that, again, good intentions, unexpected outcomes can, can result from that. As we, we saw with that case of Airbnb, I know a lot of the design team over at Airbnb. I know them to be good, honest uh, people who are, are thinking about diversity and inclusion. Nonetheless, they made some mistakes. Um, and mistakes happen in design teams uh, because some things we, we we don't have a broad enough perspective on. So um, what I was hearing from uh, Annie Jean-Baptiste, who's the, the, the head of diversity and inclusion at uh, Google, um, she was saying that we need to build in these uh, repeat checks in our process after we ship, going to different communities um, who might be impacted watching them use the product, learning how they're using the product, learning how is this you know, being used in ways that are unintended. We've got to build those checks in to make sure that there's no gap between our good intentions and the actual outcomes of what we're making. The second question in the Project Inkblot uh, Design for Diversity framework is, how do the identities within your team influence and impact your design decisions? If you have a very homogenous team, Clearly, that's going to limit the perspectives that you have. And when I say homogenous, um, I'm speaking to race, I'm speaking to gender identity, but I'm also speaking to age, especially in our industry. Um, I'm, a, I'm a rather old guy in the industry. I've got more gray hair, hair than most of my, my colleagues because uh, I've been at this for you know 20 some years. Um, so there, there can be often ageism in a lot of software companies. Um, also, people who grew up maybe poor or disenfranchised in some way, um, varying scales of abilities and um, diversity of experience is, is a really important thing to have in our teams. Because when we, when we hire and build diverse teams, we get those diverse perspectives that allow us to challenge our, the, the, the solutions that we're designing um, from lots of different angles and find things that work more effectively for more people. And that, of course, is good for business because we can reach a lot more people. You don't build a company like Google who talks about the next billion users without thinking about designing for inclusivity and diversity because the world is a diverse place. Our team should reflect that diversity um, and our work should, should speak to and, and answer those, those problems that a diverse population has. Question number three is, who might you be excluding? This is something I've heard from Benjamin Evans, um, who is on the diversity and inclusion team at Airbnb, is you know asking yourself and challenging your teams, who are we excluding from this conversation? When we're thinking about this product, who might not be able to use this product as effectively as we think? Um, or we might even ask, who's not involved in this conversation right now? We might need um, people within the company with different perspectives maybe different disciplines, different backgrounds, um, who could help us look at this problem from different angles? Who might we be ex excluding is a simple rule of thumb, simple question we can keep in the back of our mind. Bring up in any meeting, it's something that everyone can remember and challenge and, and uh, leads to more robust debate. And I love this, the idea of an all people statement. So one way for us to answer that question, who uh, are we excluding, is by making something called an all people statement. So all people can express themselves in our product. And if you've got a very narrow representation of emojis, um, uh, that, that could be one, um, 
one way that uh, you're, you're falling short. Can all people express themselves with the emoji set that you have? Um, all people can fill out our form and um, report their identity effectively. If you look at the U.S. Census this year, when they asked gender, they said they offered male or female. Those were the, the two. So that it was presented only in a binary perspective. I have talked to people about their experience of encountering forms like that, um, like the one in the census, U.S. Census. And the feeling is of profound sadness, of feeling excluded, of feeling uh, inadequate, of feeling li like there's um, a simple HTML form reminds them of all of the times throughout their life where they have felt inadequate and not part of society and unseen. Um, and that's a terrible feeling in terms of like designing for emotion. It's so profound. I mean, that's, it's such a profound emotion and a, and a profound feeling. And with some simple challenging of our assumptions, we can think we can make small changes, small design decisions that have huge repercussions for so many people. So all people can express themselves in their messages using emojis. Is it true? Uh, you, your team can create all people statements and uh, put your biases in front of you to challenge those. So talking about inclusion um, inevitably brings us to this topic of the feeling of belonging, which is a very profound human feeling, human instinct. The reason why communities in human history for thousands of thousands of years the worst punishment you can inflict on someone was not death. It was excommunication. It was being excluded from the group because humans are inherently social animals. We, we work together. Um, we need to feel that sense of belonging is the sense of belonging is an instinct to be connected to the larger organism of humanity. Um, we are individuals certainly, but ultimately we are a collective and, <laughs> what what year teaches us that principle better than 2020? Um, I'm sure many of you feel isolated, um, disconnected from your communities, from people, uh, because you're trapped at home, because you're you've been under lockdown and quarantine, and you know, that sense of belonging. We all know what that feels like to not belong. It feels terrible. It's one of the worst feelings that one can have. I'm going to share a personal story. Um, these are my boys. This is Bellamy in the uh, gray space hoodie and my son, Olivier, in the yellow. And, um, you know, my experience growing up as a white male uh, growing up in the Midwest was um, it, it's, it's great privilege. It's just privilege. I didn't, didn't necessarily grow up privileged financially, but I grew up privileged in terms of being a white male in America at this point in history, which comes with so much privilege. And uh, my children and the world um, teach me that not everybody has that experience of things being easy. Um, it's just a few weeks ago, I was sitting on the living room floor with my kids playing Candyland on a Sunday morning. And I looked down at the game board and I said to Bellamy, uh, here, my six-year-old, and uh, I said, hey, Bellamy, who designed this game? And he looked at the board and saw all white Caucasian characters at every stage of the game. And he said, a white person designed it. He's six. He just started first grade. Um, and he sees that and he feels that. And you know, I, I've had experiences where um, a parent hands me a Band-Aid to put on my kid, and it's a Band-Aid that um, is for a white person. You know, it's designed for a white person. Um, there are so many things that are designed in this world with such narrow perspective, and these things are additive. They are additive, and they say, uh, they create a situation where if you are not part of that power structure, of that, um, it's not even a majority group. It's just the, the group in, of, of most influence and power. Um, it's, it's a feeling of being unseen, of unincluded, of excommunication, of um, being left out. 
And those things add up every day of, you know, a person's life when they experience that over and over to the point where it becomes, you know, it, it's a lot to bear. It's a lot to bear on a day-to-day -day basis. This is Diogenes Burrito. He works at Slack. He's a designer. And he had an experience where he was designing a simple series of graphics. Um, there's these add to Slack buttons that uh, Slack was launching to be able to funnel things into Slack. Uh, more effectively from different places. And uh, Dio, uh, he, he had some stock illustration stuff that was in the library at Slack. And he got those illustrations and he said to himself, uh, I don't want to make this a thing, but it kind of is a thing. It's the right thing to do. The stock illustrations were, they're all white. And he was designing a, a hand that was going to hold a button that said add to Slack. And he just changed it to brown and he launched it uh, and put it out into the world. Slack launched it. And the experience was, um, it was profound. It was such a small thing. This is what it looked like. Add to Slack. It's a brown hand. And people responded on Twitter and various places. Really appreciate the brown hand in this graphic. I'm so used to seeing flesh colored hands in graphics. Flesh, what does that mean? It may seem like a small thing, but when you see graphics over and over excluding your skin color, it matters. It matters. It adds up. Um, it adds up, and uh, it is this residue, this emotional debt um, that people carry with them throughout their lives. And it doesn't have to be that way. So here's Dio. He actually wrote about this and uh, published in Fast Company an article about this. He said, why was the choice an important one and why did it matter to people of color who saw it? Simple answer is that they rarely see something like that. As people saw the image and immediately noticed how unusual it was, they were appreciative of being represented in a world where American media has the bad habit of portraying white people as the default and everyone else as deviations from the norm. So simple things like um, illustrations, um, how we present humans in our products, in our marketing, uh, says a lot. And it says who is invited to this experience. Jennifer Holm, who's a great illustrator over at Airbnb, built a whole illustration system for the product, for all of the design team to use. And it's built around diversity of perspectives. Uh, we see people with uh, disabilities. We see people of different racial backgrounds. Um, we see um, mixed race couples. Um, so that host guest experience, it's, it's, a, it's not, not so much a reminder, like a conscious reminder, but it is a representation of this is who we are. This is the world. This is... Um, this is humanity, and this is what you're going to experience when you have that Airbnb experience. Let's talk a little bit about personality. Uh, personality is also uh, a, an innate uh, part of the human experience. Um, personality is, it, it connects us with so many emotions. It's this mysterious force that draws us together. Sometimes it repels us too. I've certainly met a lot of people with personalities that uh, rub me the wrong way. Um, but it is a force that helps us create social bonds and create you know, uh, small groups and communities. And I want to share this because personality can be a very powerful tool for designing great products. Um, this is Headspace. It is one of my current favorite apps because I use it every morning. I wake up at uh, about 5.45, 6 a.m., make my coffee, and I meditate. And um, I find it to be a, a really important part of my day of um, you know dealing, coping with the stress of 2020. Personality is baked into the Headspace product design experience. At first glance, the personality seems like it's cartoony, it's funny. But when you look at it more closely, you realize that the idea of meditation and mindfulness, the preconceived notions we have of that, of it's something only for an ascetic to, to practice or someone who really has uh, presence of mind to be able to do successfully. 
Headspace uses character animation and personality to show that the mind is so imperfect. We're all imperfect. And that's okay. That's just part of the human experience. It takes the edges off of the stress and anxiety that people bring to their product. And that makes it more sticky. And it's kind of amazing how effective it's been uh, because not so long ago, the idea of a meditation app on your phone, that wasn't even a category. And now we see multiple big players in that software space. I even like that their logo, that circle, it looks like a circle, but if you look closely, it's imperfect, just like us and our messy heads. Anna Charity, uh, who's the former head of design at Headspace, said that the mind is a complex place and it isn't always an easy place to inhabit, which is why meditation is so valuable. We knew that we had to develop a style that translated these ideas in an approachable and relatable way. Animation and illustration became integral to the brand. By using characters and storytelling, we could break down the barriers of a tough subject matter and present it in a lighthearted but sensitive way. Characters are a great vehicle to represent the weirdness inside your head. It feels playful and memorable as a result. Personality influences our perceptions. Influences our perceptions of one another, but it also influences our perceptions of products. Here's another company that uses personality, but in a different way. Definitely a lot of humor. It's a company called Gooder. They sell sunglasses that are inexpensive. You could, you know, buy 10 pair, have them in your car, your, uh, you know, your, your book bag, uh, in your house, various places. If you lose a pair, it's all good. But they're not just cheap sunglasses. They're actually really fun. Each product has a story, has a silly name. Uh, this one's called Merlin Squirrel Fetish. They write a lot of content. Um, I think it's clearly inspired by the original Beta Brand experience uh, not so long ago. Beta Brand's brand has since evolved. Um, but it's, it's fun and it makes these products memorable. It makes the company memorable. That leads to word of mouth marketing, which is effective. Um, and it brings people back and creates that, that personal connection to what they're making. It makes, it's like adding a story to a physical object. And when we do that, when we add a story and personality to a product, its value, its perceived value goes up. In fact, there's science behind this. Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker, two professors, researchers, create a project called Significant Objects. And they purchased $128 of tchotchkes. They went to cheap secondhand stores, bought a bunch of little objects like this ceramic cow, which is like a creamer. Um, lots of goofy little objects that, you know, for 50 cents, quarter, 10 cents here, maybe a buck there. $128 investment. And then they and their research assistants proceeded to write very detailed, not necessarily humorous, but detailed in-depth stories about each one of these products, they photographed them and they listed them on eBay. And they sold them for $3,612.51 or 28 times return on investment, which is amazing. How did they do that? Why would people spend so much money for what is, you know, these are unremarkable objects. It's the story. It's the personality that comes from that story that's imbued in the product uh, by creating that because humans are storytellers. This is how we connect and communicate with one another. We're, we've got these supercomputers within us of extracting the moral of a story and taking that on board. And when we do that, it creates emotion in us. And emotion is, uh, it changes the human experience. And that is valuable when you change my human experience for the better. Owning a fun thing that has a story that you can tell to someone else. Um, we're giving that good feeling to someone else and telling that story. And in turn, we're receiving that good feeling ourselves. So that object becomes a lot more valuable. There are times, though, where personality can hit the edges, can be too much. 
And I found a great example in an unexpected place, which is in some API documentation over at Slack. Um, of course, a lot of people make chat bots for Slack, and those bots often have personality. Um, sometimes the personality gets a little over the top and annoying. So in the Slack API documentation, they say, don't construct a personality that means you have to add sentence upon sentence in order to get a joke in, uh, in keeping with your bot's sense of humor. No one cares. Get to the point. Here's an example. Don't do it like this. Cowgirl Cooker Chatbot says, did you hear the one about the brown paper bag cowboy? He had a brown paper bag hat, a brown paper bag boots, a brown paper bag shirt, and a pair of brown paper bag pants. He was arrested for rustling. Anyway, ready to schedule your cookout? That was a whole lot of not so great joke to get to the piece of content that's important. You can do it more like this. Howdy partner, ready to schedule your cookout. Personality is there. We get it. It feels relatable and human, um, but it's not in the way. We don't want the personality to be overbearing. So when you think about designing for emotion and all the various things you could do, personality, like designing a personality for your product might seem overwhelming. It can be uh, when it's something as pervasive as, as Headspace and its personality or Gooder. That's where you know designing for emotion is part of a business strategy for acquisition and retention and so forth. But for those of us working on products that are already out in the world, or maybe it's a newish thing we're working on, and we want to just experiment and, and make smaller bets, maybe you think, I've got to get permission for my boss to do this. We can try breaking a big idea into a small piece and design for just a moment. So when we think about moments of emotional engagement, again, could be creating a moment of joy, addressing a moment of sadness, fear, or mistrust or anything that's in between. We think about the customer experience, the customer journey. And along that, that journey, there are peaks where things are great, and there are valleys where things are not so great. These are opportunities to design a moment that could create a more memorable, satisfaction, uh, satisfactory, emotionally engaging experience. Let me give you an example of a valley moment where there's a lot of negative emotion in the experience. Many of you have probably used or checked out TurboTax created by Intuit, um, you know, creating your, your tax returns, filing your tax returns. Not a fun experience. It's intimidating for many of us, um, and it's just boring and um, tedious for most. But there's a point as you're filing your taxes, if you're filing jointly, you're married, married couple, where you're asked if your spouse has passed away. If you check that box, yes, that's a heavy moment where the loss that you felt from losing your best friend, from you losing your partner, all comes flooding back. You thought you were just filing your taxes, but actually you're digging through your past. You're digging through your relationship and reminded uh, that someone you love dearly is not with you today. So when you check that box that someone has passed away before filing this return, it's just a sentence that shows up. It's not a big deal. It says, we're sorry to hear about your loss. You can count on us to help you get their tax return done right. It's a small thing. This is not a big design project. This is not, I'm going to go ask the boss if I have permission to do this. It is simply acknowledging the humanity of the moment. What might people feel when they tick that box. That's a heavy box. Just acknowledge the humanity of the moment. Make them feel seen. It's had a profound effect on a lot of people. This is one TurboTax customer who wrote in, I finally got around to doing taxes yesterday. After our information was transferred from last year's return, it asked if either of us had passed away. I entered the information that my husband died on June 15th. And a screen came up that said, we're sorry for your loss. I sat there and stared at it, crying for a few minutes. It was so cathartic. Please pass on to the team how much that one little sentence meant to me. 
whoever thought that up must be a very caring person. We have agency in our work and we can make decisions. Uh, we can tr choose to pay attention to the humanity of the moment to, you know, just pause for a moment and think about what are pe people feeling? What are the emotions that people are bringing to the work? And how might we do small things to address that? The TurboTax team, um, which is inside of Intuit, uh, Intuit has a, a long standing um, company value, which is designed for delight. Uh, but the TurboTax team took a different approach and they said, you know, designed for delight, not, not quite what we're talking about in this situation. This is what we call an ownable moment. It's a moment in the customer journey. In this case, it's a valley moment, not a peak moment, where we can um, speak to that experience. Karen Ingstrom, who was formerly on the TurboTax team, he's over at Facebook these days, said that emotional design is not just about delight and positive emotion. In reality, emotional design is about, is about all emotion, good and especially bad. If the user's feeling uncertain or fe fearful, don't shy away from that or sweep it under the rug. Instead, lean into it. Let the user know you understand where they are emotionally and offer a way to put them at ease. I call that sanding off the edges. What about peak moments where, you know, there's a great moment in the customer journey? That's actually how I got into this topic uh, many moons ago back at MailChimp was I was given unprecedented freedom, uh, my colleague and I, to rebuild MailChimp. The, the founders of MailChimp hired us and we rebuilt everything, wrote every line of code over and designed every screen again. And as part of that experience, because I'd been a customer, I knew what it was like to send an email campaign. It took a lot of effort, a lot of writing, a lot of creative effort, uh, producing that email. And you press send and at the end of it, it feels like such uh, an emotional moment, like in a positive way, like someone should run in the room and give me a high five and hand me a beer. Um, so we just simply acknowledged that moment uh, with a high five, simple piece of text that I wrote that said, you know, high five, you did it. Your email is, is going out now. And we made an animation um, that was part of that experience. So here it is. You're about to press send and you can't suck the email back in once it's out. Once it's out, it's out. If you made a mistake, broken link, it's in the world. Send. And you get that high five moment. And we spent too much time animating this, what seemed like too much time at the moment. But uh, looking back, it was... Uh, probably time well invested. And that um, led to a lot of experiences where people were tweeting about it, um, posting on Instagram, literally high-fiving their screen. One guy high-fived his screen so hard he knocked over his iMac. Um, just, you know, it connects with the emotion of the moment in a very meaningful way. And that led to a lot of people um, sharing and a lot of word of mouth. We didn't create this as some marketing gimmick. It was just, you know, like this is the customer experience that we know is happening. Let's design something that speaks to that moment. And it had a lasting profound effect. I think people are still tweeting about it today. So of course there is science of moments and how they work, how we might design for moments. I'm thinking about timing, when, when would a moment happen? It can happen at any point in the journey, but it's especially powerful towards the end of a journey. You might know who Daniel Kahneman is, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, TED Talk. Uh, guy's done a lot of research. His colleague, he and uh, his colleague Amos uh, Tversky discovered a principle called the peak end rule by studying, uh, of all things, colonoscopies. People who went in for a colonoscopy, uh, they studied two different groups. Uh, it's a very unpleasant experience. Um, and there was one group that had a 13 minute colonoscopy and another group that had an 11 minute colonoscopy. So one group that had a longer experience of something terrible, but the, um, the last minute of that longer, uh, colonoscopy, uh, it was less painful. Basically there's a probe, uh, stuck in, you know, where, and it, it can be painful. And so the probe didn't move for the last minute. And when the experience concluded for both groups, 
One group that had a shorter experience, but a painful last minute. One group that had a longer experience, but a just uncomfortable last minute. The, the group with the longer uh, experience, longer colonoscopy procedure reported that, you know, it wasn't that bad. It was, it was not good, but clearly, but it, it wasn't awful. The other group was just like, that's the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Um, and so, uh, Kahneman and Tversky discovered that there's this, this gap between the experiencing self that's receiving all the inputs from your senses of the moment, the experience of now and the remembering self which stores parts of that memory, but not all of the experience and it cherry picks it. And if there's a very negative or a very positive experience, extreme emotion, those things get encoded very quickly because it's a self-preservation mechanism. Very unpleasant things we want to avoid to you know, save ourselves in the future and positive things we wanna repeat so we could have that experience again. So the experiencing self and the remembering self are different and the remembering self, even though you got a 13 minute colonoscopy that you remembered, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, as extreme at the end, um, that influences that encoding of your memory. And of course there's, there's science with all of this stuff that there's neurotransmitters that are encoding this stuff that emotional experiences, um, Something happens and it goes into our memory and stores for the long term. Great, uh, really great book called Brain Rules by Dr. John Medina. Um, and in that, he says that the amygdala, which is part of your limbic system, where emotion and long term memory occur, it's chock full of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And it uses dopamine the way an office assistant uses post it notes. And the brain detects emotionally charged events. The amygdala releases dopamine into the system. And because dopamine greatly aids memory and information processing, you could say the post-it note reads, remember this. So long-term memory and emotion are very closely linked, which is another reason why emotion is such a critical part of design. And timing that emotion at the right point in the customer journey can greater influence the memory of that experience in a positive way. Last thing I want to talk to you about tonight, and then we'll have a, an open conversation here, is the business side of emotional design. Um, oftentimes, we find ourselves in situations where we're working with colleagues who um, may not buy into the same value system as us. Let's create a really great, memorable product. It's more than just functional, reliable, and usable. Let's create something that's emotionally engaging. Not everyone's going to buy that. But Sam Altman, Y Combinator chairman said, it's better to build something, a, uh, something that a small number of users love than a large number of users like. He's seen a lot of products. He's seen a lot of companies over the years. So I take his advice uh, to heart here. You're thinking about designing something that's emotionally engaging, creates greater likelihood that people are going to really love, feel connected to that product. I think that's a big reason why Headspace is as successful as it has been. It's a great product, it's great people there, um, but designing for emotion is so central to their, their business strategy. How do we design for emotion in an agile world where we are shipping very iterative, iteratively, we're moving quickly, um, we wanna get code or get product into the market very quickly? This is something I've heard a million times. Emotional design. It sounds nice, but we can add that after we build our MVP. It's a very flawed way of thinking. Um, you know, thinking that, oh, we'll get to the emotional engagement later. Let's just make this functional, reliable thing and get it into the world. Uh, we'll test product market fit and see how things go. I want you to think about downloading an app and trying that app out and realizing, man, this sucks. It's a terrible experience. And you delete it. Do you go back to the app store and download it again in six months? If so, you are a rare breed. Very few people do. And if that's the case, then why would we put off creating that emotionally engaging experience when that first impression, the primacy effect we talked about earlier, it's so central to the success and the stickiness of our product. 
if people are going to delete the product and not come back, it's going to be hard for us to hit our goals, be successful, build a successful company that people want to pay money for our products. Uh, so we've got to think differently about what an MVP is. We talked about the primacy effect, so I won't restate that. But when we think about the minimum viable product, here's what we don't want is that we create an MVP from that bottom strat of like, ooh, let's just make some functionality and get it out into the world and see if we have product market fit. We need to think about the slice on the vertical, um, on the y-axis, that we get some functionality that's descoped, reliability and usability that is also emotionally engaging. And that's what an MVP is. That's what we go to market with. It doesn't do everything. It does a few things and it's really well thought out. It's really well done. So when people have that first experience in that primacy effect, they use it and they think, this is pretty awesome. I can see that this is going to be great. It's going to be useful for me. It's emotionally engaging in whatever way that makes sense, whether that's creating joy for a peak moment or addressing some negative, negative experience that people might have, you know, had in, uh, you know, a, a banking product or something. Emotional design helps us achieve business goals. And this is something that we need to think about. Emotion seems squishy. It's very qualitative. How do we measure this? If we can't measure it, is it worth investing in? We talked about category creation with Headspace. They wouldn't have had that success without emotional design. I'm certain of it. Well, simple. We saw that example. It's helped them with customer acquisition to inspire trust in an automated investing platform, which seems maybe confusing, intimidating for some. It's FinTech, it's banking. Can I trust this? And it helps with retention. It addresses the fears that we have uh, when we're experiencing a market downturn. And we might want to, we're so afraid we want to sell all of our holdings from in the market. Or Duolingo, if you've used that. Emotional design influences session length. It keeps you learning for longer. And it brings you back into the product to achieve your learning goals. I experienced this at MailChimp. Emotional design certainly played a big role in our growth. And of course, it helped us with market reach because our customers kept telling everyone about us. We marketed the product, but we didn't have to market it as much as, uh, you know, as we might have had our customers not been telling people about it. And of course, you're probably familiar with this story of Slack, that Slack is a tool that has had emotional design built in uh, since the very early stages. And it came into a market that was already really well controlled by another company, Atlassian, who made HipChat. Many of you probably used to use HipChat. I did. Good product. Liked it a lot. Had mostly the same types of features as Slack. It was a little different. UI-wise, there were a few things that were different. Andrew Wilkinson, who, is, uh, who leads MetaLab, he and his team worked on that first design of Slack. And he wrote some of his thoughts about this. He said that when you hear people talk about Slack, they often say, it's fun. Using it doesn't feel like work. It feels like slacking off, even when you're using it to get stuff done. But when you look under the hood, it's almost identical to every other chat app. You can create a room add people, share files, and chat as a group or direct message one another. Functionally, very similar. Emotionally, very different. With Slack, a bubbly, bright UI, delightful interactions, and hilarious copywriting come together to create a personality, a personality which has triggered something powerful in its users. They care about it. They want to share it with others. It feels like a favorite coworker not like a tool or a utility. Slack, this, these stats are a little uh, out of date, uh, not too far off, roughly 10 million daily active users, impressive, 85,000 paying customers, $13 billion market cap right now. Uh, not bad for a product that started out as a video game and pivoted over and uh, came into a market that was already controlled by HipChat, Atlassian. Eventually, Atlassian just shut down HipChat, threw up their hands. They tried to create another product to replace it to, to be competitive. And they said, we give up. We're just going to invest in Slack. Slack won through emotional design. 
how do we integrate emotional design into the design process or the product process? Let me walk you through it. First, investigate the emotional needs of your customers. Spend time with your customers. Talk to them. I can't believe that it's 2020 and we still are advocating for customer research. Um, customer research is a way to de-risk what we're putting into the market. You don't have to pivot 50 times if you spend time talking to your customers to uh, see what they need before you produce and ship something. You can use tools like the um, empathy map. An empathy map is, um, as you're talking to customers, it's a way for you to ask questions and start to note, what are they hearing? What are they seeing? What are they taking in? What do they think and feel about what's going on in their world and the products that they use? What are they preoccupied by? What do they say and do? What are their attitudes? What pains do they experience and what do they hope to gain by using a new product? That's a way for us to map and start to get a glimpse into the emotional state that, that customers bring to the, what we design. You can also check out, um, there's a great company called Mattermind Studio that published um, these, this emotion-centered design toolkit um, for doing research with customers that helps you get into these emotional states of mind with customers and, and see how they're thinking about their world. Step two, you can map the customer journey. Creating a journey map is a straightforward thing to do. In fact, if you look at Atlassian's playbook, um, they've got a playbook for lots of design processes and uh, team uh, you know, collaboration processes. One of the things is how to create a journey map. How do we map the journey, find the peaks, find the valleys, identify those moments, um, and think about the emotions that people bring to those moments. Design your high five moment, design your TurboTax moment, find it and uh, build it into your product. Those moments are powerful. It's what um, sticks in people's minds. It creates long-term memory, creates word of mouth marketing, um, and it just treats people like humans, uh, which is uh, the right thing to do. Finally, step four, consider how to measure the impact of the moment. There are lots of ways to measure these things. How might we measure uh, a high five moment? Well, we could count tweets. Um, how might we uh, you know, measure the impact of that TurboTax Valley moment? You could see how it affects customer um, engagement through um, support channels. There are lots of different things that we could look at. Your metrics are going to be different because your product is different than everybody else's. Let's revisit what it means to design for emotion. Let's think beyond designing for delight. Let's think about the full spectrum of emotion. Here we are in complex times, feeling complex emotions. It's a great time for us to reflect on the processes that we've been using and revisit what could we do to be more inclusive. What can we do to challenge our biases and assumptions, to invite belonging, to um, address fears and mistrust and all of that range of emotions that people bring to the things that we design? I am, of course, just scratching the surface today on this topic of designing for emotion, that intersection of psychology and design. I actually wrote a whole book about it, Designing for Emotion, the second edition out there in the world from a book apart. Um, if this is interesting, you might want to check it out. But for now, thank you so much for joining this first Designers and Geeks online event. It's been a joy to be here with you today.